In this video, we're going to be looking at estimating the difference between two population means. So estimating mu1 minus mu2. Okay, so difference between two population proportions. So we'll be um, essentially comparing two groups here. There'll also be a video looking at estimating the difference between um, two population proportions rather than two population means. Okay, so here we're estimating the difference between two population means. For estimating the difference between two population proportions, there's a separate video on that. So the method that we're going to look at here um, again has some conditions attached and there's also two different types of intervals that we can calculate here so we'll, we'll talk about all of that. Our conditions for inference here we need two simple random samples, right? We need one for group one and one for group two and those samples need to be independent. And when you see independent here in this context, don't think back to what, what we did when we were talking about probability rules and that really formal definition of independence. Here, what we just want to think of is that they're unrelated, that they don't contain the same individuals in, in both samples. Okay, They need to be two completely separate and distinct samples um, from the larger population. Okay, so samples need to be independent. There are methods for dealing with dependent samples. Those will be treated in a different section. They won't come up here. Okay, so two simple random samples. The samples need to be independent. We need um, to know that x1 and x2 are normally distributed or we need the sample sizes to be greater than or equal to 30 for both groups. Okay, this is again going back, whoops, sorry, that says N1 greater than or equal to 30 and N2 greater than or equal to 30. This is going back to that central limit theorem, okay? It is vitally important that um, if we're going to be using essentially the normal distribution to calculate this confidence interval, that we know that the data follow an approximately normal distribution, that the X bar data will follow an approximately normal distribution. And from the central limit theorem, we know that's the case if we know that the original data values are normally distributed, or if we have large enough sample sizes, if we have greater than or equal to 30. But now we have to extend that to both groups, since we're talking about two groups here. Okay. Then, if sigma 1 and sigma 2 are known, which almost never happens, then we use 2 samp z int, right? If the population standard deviations are known, we use the z. If sigma 1 or sigma 2 is unknown, then we use 2 samp t int. Okay, so these conditions need to be met, and then depending on whether or not we know the values for sigma, that determines which interval we use in the calculator. Do we use 2 samp z or 2 samp t? Okay. And the reason it's 2 samp here is because we have two independent simple random samples, and then z if sigmas are known, t if at least one of them is unknown. <clears throat> Again, you're welcome to look at the um, by hand formula for doing this kind of computation, um, but for the most part we'll just be doing this in the calculator using either 2 samp z or 2 samp t. And uh, the interpretation piece here is a little bit more complicated, so that's really what I want to spend a lot of time in this video uh, talking about. So let me find my example. Here's an example dealing with the weights of pro football and pro basketball players. Okay, so for pro football players, um, X1, that's our first sample, we had a sample size for our first sample of 21, and the subscript of 1 here is just referring to the fact that this was our first group. Okay, so we had 21 individuals in this first group of pro football players. 
their um, average weight in the sample. Oh, sorry, this is their weight. Weight of. Okay, the uh, average weight in the sample was 259.6, and that was in pounds. And the uh, standard deviation of the weights in the sample, notice that's the sample, is, let's see, 12.1 um, pounds. Okay. Then we had another sample that had the weight of pro basketball players. and that's X sub 2, right, indicating that it's our second group. In that sample, we had 19 individuals. Our X2 bar, or the average weight of individuals in that group, was 205.8 pounds. And our standard deviation for the weights in the second group was 12.9 pounds. Okay, so this is all of the information that we have, and what we're asked to find is find a 99% confidence interval for the difference in population mean weights of pro football versus pro basketball players. And what this is usually used for is to make a meaningful comparison between the two groups to figure out uh, which group has the larger mean or the smaller mean or if they're essentially roughly equivalent. So um, here's what we got. Here's all of our data. We want to find a 99% confidence interval. First thing we want to do is go back up here and check our conditions for inference. So, do we have two simple random samples? Well, I didn't actually read this part of the problem to you, but it does start off by saying that these data come from independent random samples of professional football and basketball players. So, it stipulated that not only were they simple random samples, but also that the samples were independent. Even if it hadn't explicitly stated that they were independent, we can tell that they should be unrelated because these are pro football players and these are pro basketball players. Okay? There's not a whole lot of overlap between those two groups. Then, um, oh, it also says in the problem to note that the uh, weight distributions are mound-shaped and symmetric. So that meets this normally distributed criterion, which means that we didn't need this part since it's an or. And notice that we didn't have that part, right? We had relatively small samples here, 21 and 19. But it was stated that the weights are roughly normally distributed. And then nowhere in here were we given values for sigma, right? We have S. We have the sample standard deviations for both groups. We don't have the population standard deviations for both groups. So we're going to be using a 2-samp T int here. A 2-samp T int. So in the calculator, here we go, we're going to do stat, all the way over to the right to tests, go down quite a ways, oh, there it is, 2-samp t int, remember not to select 2-samp t test, it's a totally different thing. Okay, so select that. Then the calculator will ask you, do you have raw data or do you have stats? If you had raw data for both groups, you would have put them into two separate lists, list one and list two. But that's not what we had here. We were given summary statistics. X1 bar was 259.6 pounds. Uh, SX1, that's our sample standard deviation for the first group. That's 12.1. Whoops, sorry, 12.1, not 2.1. There we go. And there were 21 individuals in that sample. For our second sample, X2 bar was 205.8. SX2 was 12.9. Our sample size was 19 for that sample. Confidence level, we were asked, I think, for a 99. Yep, 99. So we'll leave that there. And then it'll ask you this thing about pooling. <laughs> um, pooling, generally speaking, it is safer not to pool. But there are some circumstances under which it makes sense to pool. And this actually is one of them. Um, pooling 
is what you would do if your sigmas were the same or close to the same. And here we don't have sigmas, but we do have s values. We have sample standard deviations. And if those are pretty close to one another, um, it's totally safe to pool. Here we've got one that's 12.1, here's 12.9. We could pool here, uh, but you can only do that if your standard deviations are relatively close to one another. Uh, again, it's always safe to not pool. It's actually a more conservative estimate. So you can just always select no here. But in this circumstance, I'm actually going to select yes, since our um, standard deviations are so close together. And then we calculate. And it'll take your calculator a bit. It's going to have to chew on it. And then there's our values. So here's what we get out. We get 43.081 comma 64.519. Now, here's the thing that you have to be really careful of when you're interpreting these. Most people, when they see this, because we know that we're estimating the difference in population mean weights of pro football and pro basketball players, people tend to want to see this first part and go, oh, that goes with our first group, that's the pro football. This goes with our second group, that's the pro basketball. The problem is if you try to interpret that interval in that way, what you've ended up saying is that the average weight of pro football players is 43 pounds and the average weight of pro basketball players is 64 pounds. And I think we can all agree that that makes absolutely no logical sense. So that's not what this is quantifying. It's not talking about the two groups separately. It's comparing them. It's finding the difference in weights. So here's what we are actually saying here. We are 99% confident that the population mean weight of pro football players is between 43.081 pounds and 64.519 pounds greater than pro basketball players. Okay. This is estimating the difference in weights of the two groups, the difference between pro football and pro basketball players' weights. And it's that difference that's between 43 pounds and about 64 pounds. Since the football players came first, we were subtracting football minus basketball, and the interval that we got out was entirely positive. So at our lowest estimate, the football players weighed more by about 43 pounds. And at the high end estimate, the football players still weighed more by about 64 pounds. What you'll find is that if you get an interval that has two positive endpoints, the first group has the greater mean. And this will tell you how much by. If you get an interval that's all negative, that would have meant that the second group had the greater mean, because if we're subtracting and getting negative values, the second group must be the greater values. So second group has greater mean. And again, the numbers would tell you by how much. It is also possible to get an interval that ranges from negative to positive. So at the low end, the difference between the two groups is negative, indicating that the second group has the greater mean. And at the high end, the difference between the two groups is positive, indicating that the first group has the greater mean. Here, what we're really saying is that it's possible there's no difference between the two groups. We can't really say a whole lot useful about that other than it's possible there's no difference. Okay. So that's essentially how these break down. Very straightforward to calculate this in the calculator. The interpretation piece is really the confusing piece. Here's your three different cases and what they would mean. If we had had one where we had known both values for sigma, the only thing that would have been different is we would have used 2SAMP-Z instead of 2SAMP-T.